So let me ask you a simple question. Let's go to, to Isaiah. Before I ask you a question, I have to read this. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It's an interesting story. About 700 years before Jesus was born. These are the words of the great prophet Isaiah. 700 years or so before Christ was born. He said, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Isaiah is prophesying. He says, look, the virgin will conceive a child. What a sign. A virgin. In other words, she will have no intimacy. And yet, she will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. And it will call him. Love this. We'll call him what? Emmanuel, which means what? God is with us. Think about it just for a moment. Look at it back. Look at it back one more time. He says, the Lord is giving you the nation of Israel, the nation of Judea. He's giving you a sign. In other words, here is a sign that you should not miss. <laughs> and this isn't a sign that is going to be somehow in the sky. A person appearing from heaven. This isn't invisible for everybody easy to read and understand. A virgin. A virgin will conceive a child. Wow. What a sign. Let me ask you a simple question. <laughs> How do you read that sign? How do you know that sign? I'll just be very brief and straight to the point. This sign is more for you and I. In retrospective, look at me. In retrospective, that it was the sign even for the people of the first century. Because how would you, living in the first century, without much of social media at all, no internet, no newspapers, all the news they knew were word of mouth. How would you have known who is the virgin that is conceiving a child? What sign is it for few? In fact, it looked like it was so hidden and it was so um, secluded that who in the first century saw that sign? Come on, reason with me. But I believe this sign is for you and I. If you ever question God speaking, God relating to you and I through Jesus. If you ever question if Jesus is the way, think about this. Who is a virgin that is not married, no intimacy with no man, and yet conceive a baby? Think about it. One of the most powerful proof that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That he is the door to the Father. Is right here. 700 years before he was born, a man stood up and he says, the Lord is giving you a sign. Watch out. A virgin will conceive a baby and she will call him Emmanuel which means God is with us 21st century 2017 this prophecy is more relevant than ever this prophecy is more powerful than ever and this prophecy is more clear by far more clear than it was in the 21st century. So with having said that, let me ask you this. Who is your favorite Disney princess? There are 14 princesses. <laughs> Who's your favorite? 14 princesses. I did some research just because, you know, I have to break the ice. Everybody has to kind of relate. So, you know, I've seen a lot of ranking. And obviously Disney made all these princesses famous. And so, uh, you know, if you ask different demographic groups, you know, groups of kids are special. They'll have a different, different, um, uh, you know, princesses that are the most profound, powerful, beautiful, you name it, most 
But what is interesting is that one princess stood the test of time like no one else. And her name is Cinderella. Yay! <laughs> Cinderella. And honestly, the, the title of the message today, Marina, show, show it to us. Here's the title of the message today. Are we ready? The real Cinderella story. I decided to go Disney on you. I decided that, you know, uh, let's just have a Disney here. It'll be nice. So let me ask you this. I don't know about you, but we have, we have about 25, 26 nationalities represented here in this building. That means there are people here that were born in 25, 26 different nations. They were born not like, hey, my dad was O'Brien, O'Conan, O'Reilly, or whatever that is. I'm talking about not Ireland, like my grandpa moved. I'm talking about people were born. In a 25-plus nation sitting right here today. Yet in, I guarantee you, in every nation, there's a story of Cinderella. It might sound different. It might be whatever names, and I'm not going to go and try and pronounce. I, I asked some people, Brazil and India and Peru and, you know, Russia, Ukraine. I mean, different, different countries. But here's, here's the funny fact. In 1893, 1893, that's 120 years ago, a famous folklorist, Marian Cox, Ma uh, Marian Rolf Cox, you can research it. Not right now, though, please. Thank you. He put together a book. He wrote a book. And the book was called 345 Cinderella Stories Around the World. 120 years ago, there was already 345 Cinderella stories. They were celebrated around the world. I mean, this story is like in every nation, every tribe. Why? Because we love to go for the underdog. We root for them. Serge roots for Patriots because they're always underdogs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. That's why he's even wearing a hat right now. Lord have mercy on him. And so... Because, you know, every time you see Tom Brady, you feel sorry for him. But anyway, he doesn't look good. He doesn't know how to play. And so anyway, you know, and he, just to stay cool, he's wearing rings. Anyway, so, but, but we, we love to go. A lot of rings, though. Uh, we love to go for the goats. And many, I know, for, for, for the underdogs, okay? I'm telling you, don't have, don't let this symbol carry you away. Think about this for a moment, okay? Luke chapter 1. Let's go from verse 26. Here we go. Luke chapter 1 or whatever. Okay, 26. Yeah. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, we talked about it last Sunday, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. Whoa. Where? Nazareth. Where? Nazareth? A village in Galilee. Now, this was a village. We talked about it last Sunday. Can I just clarify one more time? You know how many people approximately, right now, as of today, in 2017, they estimate that there is about 3,460 people living in Nazareth at this moment. However, in a time when Jesus was born, listen to this. Nobody, Old Testament, 39 books, nobody mentions Nazareth. Talmud, no mentioning Nazareth. Josephus Flavius, historian, never mentioned Nazareth. Okay, Mishnah, the writings of personal communication between Jewish people. Nobody talks about Nazareth. Nazareth was so small that it estimated that, that there was between 60 and 80 people living in the village. They were counting every dog, every cat. I mean, they were counting everybody. They were count even probably mosquitoes. I mean, wh whoever. There's not many people. Because you hear Nazareth, especially it was in a Galilee area. Now, Galilee was a poor area. The only good thing was going for them. That was close to the sea, okay? That was it. However, if you look at the map and you study history and economy of the 21st century, nobody, no, um, no, no country would send their ship to Galilee because people were so poor, nobody was buying no product. No commercial ship was going there. It was, it was, there were a lot of people that were drinking a lot. True story. Do historical uh, research. Okay, they were drinking a lot. The life expectancy was under 50 years. Okay, as healthy food as they were eating, all organic 
naturally growing and you can imagine those days. They didn't take care of themselves. Mary, a young girl, was growing up in that small village. How small was her family that we know nothing about her mom or dad? Dr. Luke, who is penning down this gospel as we're reading, who is writing precisely of every individual and story and giving their proper background dues and naming people and so on as, as, a, as, a, as a proper writer, author, historian would do, sponsored by Theophilius, he doesn't even mention her mom. We don't know anything about her mom. We know nothing about her dad. We don't even know her, 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 her last name. We, don't, we know nothing about Mary. All we know that there's some distant relative, some maybe some auntie like old Elizabeth, that was it. That's all we know about Mary, a young girl. Now, the reason I say that is because, honestly, I believe almost every person here can identify with Mary. It was so loud. I have to say it again. Can identify with Mary. Okay? It doesn't matter where you are coming from. Think about it. God himself sends Gabriel to a village in Galilee. <laughs> I mean, okay, I have to. Do we have a script? John chapter 1, verse 47. 147. Watch this. Sorry, 46. I don't know Bible mind, but anyway. <laughs> Nazareth exclaimed Nathaniel when his, uh, his friend Philip came to him and said, Hey, we found Jesus from Nazareth. He's a Messiah. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> he doesn't even talk. Philip doesn't go and say, hey, really? Nazareth is like, I know, it's a small town, but man, there's a lot of people coming from that town. By the way, we're in the city of, of Linwood. How many great people you know from the city of, of Linwood? Jim and Jen. <laughs> okay. Who else, by the way, still lives in Linwood? There's like seven people here living? Okay. One, well, yeah, yeah, hey, the whole Brazil moved to Linwood. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Wow. W w wow. Actually, we have like 10 people. Amazing. I was thinking that like everybody's leaving us, but it, it's, it's incredible. If you look at Wikipedia and see the, the no, uh, notable people from Linwood, it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Few, few people. It's interesting. But Nazareth was not known around even the area. And so God comes to this small town that you're like, where? Can't find on the map either. Especially at that time. Because it was that small. To a girl that we know nothing about her background. Think about it. We don't know anything about her family. Think about it. And then she is a teenager. Historians and theologians estimate, based on their research, that she could have been anywhere from 12 to 17. Most people agree that she was actually between 13 and 14. I have a hard time believing. I have a hard time believing it, even though I'm reading historical quote documents. But you would come as God to a teenager. I mean, can I just for a moment, please don't, don't judge me harsh. I, I have to say this. In a culture, we give, we cut slack and, and, and try to give our young kids and say, well, just kids. And we have invented this term, adolescence. We say, while you're young, do all crazy things you can. Sleep with whoever you want to sleep. Drink as much as you want to drink. Do whatever. Because once you are older, you have to take responsibility. And you can't live a promiscuous lifestyle. So we are cutting them. I mean, we just let them do whatever. Here's a young girl. We don't know much about her family. And God says, Mary, I watch your life. You realize that you don't have to, quote, go through this adolescence where you are a 13, 14, whatever girl, you know, and just, you know, shock everybody in the middle of conversation or a mall, uh, you know, journey or whatever. And you feel like, whoa, nuclear bomb just, uh, you know. You realize that it is... Not just noble, but God is watching you 
whether you're 11, 12, <clears throat> Mandel, 13, 14, 15, 16. And it doesn't matter where you come from. Can I, can I just one more time stop? Because this is so simple, but yet so powerful. It does not matter where you come from. You know, I would love to, and not because my story is anything special, honestly, nothing special, but I would love to take you on a journey, a video journey, where I come from. You would be shocked. It's like, you look at this way and this way, there's no houses where I was born. I grew up among older people. I, I, for me to have friends, I had to like walk for 15 minutes one way to find a friend of my age, you know? Be, behind us was a cemetery. Every day going to kindergarten, I had to go to a cemetery, that especially winter time in, in, in Western Ukraine, like 4 p.m., it's already dark and you're going home from school and in the morning you're going there, it's still dark, so you go to a, literally walking through graveyard, okay? Like no friends. I mean, if, if I showed you where I come from, where I was born and grew up till I was about 11, you'll be shocked. In the middle of mountains, cold in winter, incredibly hot during summertime, like 110, 115, easy, you know? I, I had no friends to play with. I, I mean, in an area called Carpathia, people spoke a mix of German, um, uh, I don't even know what, you know, uh, Austrian slang, if I may use that, Czech, Bulgarian, and yet there was no official language. So we spoke different language, Ukraine didn't understand, until 1945, that wasn't even part of Soviet Union. In 1945, Soviet Union just chopped the area and said, you'll be part of Soviet, and nobody spoke Russian. So I was born there, there is no official language. Now we're part of Ukraine, we had to learn Ukrainian. Well, we have to learn Russian as a third language, okay? And so you, you're growing up in the area and you think, wow, do I have any future besides working on this field, literally? The first day of February, you're already preparing for the fields, the fields, the farms that you're starting in March, just slaving. So February 1st, you're already building greenhouses in a snow. You got a snow that is like, you know, two, three feet. And, 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 and you would think, do I have any future? Or will I just live here till I die in this God forgotten place and area and country? How many of you can identify with Mary? Identify with me that one day God would allow me to go around the world, 15 different countries, to learn in some of the most prestigious universities that I didn't even want to go and pay for me, pay for my education to go to Manchester and Oxford that I didn't even want to go. I was excited to be where I was. Who would have ever thought that I would immigrate to the United States and live in one of the most prosperous area, city in the world at this time? Who would have ever predicted that God would entrust my wife and I to lead a church, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, different backgrounds, and speak to people. I mean, last night we had a mayor of one of the cities just stop by our house, you know, just say hi. And so who would have thought that that would be possible in a different country? And it's simply because it doesn't matter where you come from. It does not matter where you come from. I think our biggest problem as far as our destiny and purpose, as far as our life, as far as our future, our biggest problem is this. We dwell so much on where we come from that we can never go further. And I'm not trying to be a therapist here and trying to tell you, well, you know what, don't dwell on your past because it will keep. No, I'm just telling you, come on. If your pictures, pictures of your past, if they are more than a reminder where you come from, burn them. It, 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 it should only be, and I, and I shared with you probably two years ago that I used to do this before I preach on Sunday. On Saturday night, I would go to some of the pictures and I would just remember where I come from. And the only reason I would do that is to say, Lord, thank you. Because it's a story of Cinderella, a story of Mary. It's a simple story because, as I said, nobody knows where she come from. A small town. But watch this. Let's keep reading. Luke chapter 1. We're going to read continue, okay? She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, descendant of King David. 
Gabriel, the angel, appeared to her and said, greetings. Listen to this. Favored woman. Favored woman. The Lord is with you. I'm, I'm going to make this very simple. It does not matter where you come from. But receiving God's favor changes everything. All that matters in your life, everybody look at me. All that really matters in your life is this. Have you received God's favor? Have you received the word, the truth that God says, I love you so much that I gave my son to be killed, crucified just for you. Just like Mary, every single person here today, even if you're an atheist, it's not an accident that you're here today. It's not an accident. Even if you're an agnostic, if you represent a different religion, it's not an accident you're here today. God favors you. Favor means he is so gracious that he comes to talk to you out of his goodness. Not because A, you were seeking him and B, you deserve it. But because he loves you. Think about it. God just appears and says, hey, I love you. And to prove it to you, I gave my son Jesus just for you. Think about it. So angel appears to Mary. He says, hey, you're highly favored. Wow. Anytime you th you're trying to compare yourself to anybody else or anything else, stop. Stop. And you can even tell if you feel like devil is oppressing you. And even through people. All you have to do is just say, here's the truth. It doesn't matter where I come from. God loves me. It's just so simple. It does not matter where I come. It doesn't matter what happened in my family. It doesn't matter who molested who. Sure, you might be hurt. and I'm not diminishing that. But I'm saying is on a big scheme and on a, in a big picture, it doesn't matter who hurt who and who died and who killed who. And who didn't have enough. It does not matter. The fact is God loves you. Just like angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and he says, you're highly favored. Today the Lord is telling you, you're highly favored. You are highly favored. This is truly an ultimate Cinderella story. Truly. I don't even know anything close to this in Old Testament. I don't know reading, and I did study history for six years in some of the best schools around Europe. I don't know if I read anything close to a story of Mary. And now that I know it's the truth, now that I know that it is the truth because I believe every iota, every dot in the scripture, I'm just blown away. I'm simply blown away. Why? Because who cares? Who didn't do what for me? And who wasn't there for me? Who didn't show up to my games or my performances? Or who didn't encourage me to take certain classes? Who didn't show me a way to learn, to aspire, to dream, to dream big, to desire greater things, to go for great things? doesn't matter. I'm telling you, the foundation for your success is this. Accept the grace of God in your life. Just receive it. If you could look in a mirror, if you could look in a mirror, whenever you're defeated, whenever you feel down and discouraged, if you could look in a mirror and say, God loves me. You don't need no one else to tell you that. It's the Spirit of God that tells your spirit in your heart, God loves you. And you just say it loud. Say, God loves me. And whether you cry or whether you're fighting against those very words, doesn't matter. Just keep saying it. God loves me. 
God loves me. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. And to me, the, 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 the most powerful point, ingredient to Mary's stories is, yes, it was the favor of God. But keep reading and watching this, okay? Let's continue. Let's go back to Luke chapter 1, okay? Don't be afraid, Mary, angel says, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Next page. He, Jesus, will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him a throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow, I mean, we can preach this forever. There's, there's like 10 theological points in this statement, literally. Okay, you can learn about Jesus. Okay, he is God. He is eternal. He is fully human. I mean, you name it. This is like, you know, let's not go into theology because it's a, it's a fairy tale here, okay? No, it's not a fairy tale. It sounds like fairy tale, but it's so powerful. Mary asked the angel, watch what she asked. And this is amazing. Last week we talked about Zechariah. Zechariah, who, who says, that's impossible. I'm old. How can myself and my wife have a baby? I'm old. It's impossible. You can be a priest, but don't believe God. Or you could be a teenager, a junior high school, a girl. With no proper educational, religious background. There's no one to teach her. No one to mentor her. Yet she says, watch what she says. I, I love this. How can this happen? She does not doubt that God will do it. She just wants to know how. Because why? Because she's not married. She's just like, uh, okay, but I'm not married. Do you know that I'm not married? I know God can do it. But I'm not married. I'm a virgin. The angel says what? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power, I mean, wow, this is a whole nother level of requiring faith. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. I mean, she heard about Holy Spirit from the Old Testament scriptures. But Holy Spirit will come upon you. Wow. I mean, guys, you, you don't understand what should have got through her mind. I apologize for being straightforward because we are so religious sometimes. But think about the names she was called, even in her family. A whore, a slut. Her son was called what? Come on, don't be afraid, bastard. That's right. All their life. Everybody knew she wasn't even married to Joseph. Let's be honest. So no, let's not make this a story of like, wow, okay, do you have a figure of Joseph and Mary? Like so cute and little baby. In a manger. No, this was a crazy story where who knows what are the other names that she was called. In fact, she had to go and visit Elizabeth. You, Elizabeth was hiding because she was not sure. I mean, five months she was hiding from, from, uh, from everybody else. She's old now and pregnant. But Mary is like, I'm going to go visit her. I'll, I'll just travel 90, maybe 140 miles. We talked about last Sunday. I'll, I'll just go away because people will see that I'm getting bigger and bigger, pregnant. It's embarrassing. And Joseph is nowhere around. He's working somewhere in Bethlehem. It's a crazy story. What I, what I love about Mary is this. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the son of God. Let's continue reading. Just to show you quickly. Let's continue. I mean, uh, 36 as well. I love her response. This is so powerful. I know it's, uh, we're, we're getting written. This is, this is where I think. After understanding God's favor, this is your part. This is my part. This is our part as we are studying the story of Mary. Look at Mary's re response to angel, okay? Verses 36 and on, okay? What's more, you re so, she, so angel tells her the story Elizabeth has become pregnant her old age. People used to say that, you know, she's a, uh, next page, Marina. People used to say what? She was barren, but she has conceived a son. And we talked about it last Sunday, okay? For nothing is impossible with God. That's what Angel says. Mary responded what? I need to stop here because I want you all to be geared this coming Christmas. Whether your Christmas started yesterday, starts today, maybe on Friday, maybe Saturday, maybe Sunday morning. By the way, we're going to have two services Sunday morning. Sunday morning, one service, and Sunday evening, 5 o'clock, our 
candlelight service. It's going to be awesome, beautiful, okay? But watch this, everybody. We know so much of the Bible, but sometimes we have so little faith. We know so much of the Bible, from the Bible, in the Bible. We did genealogy studies. We Googled it. We listened to scholars debating, you name it. And yet, oftentimes, we have so little faith. How come so much knowledge about God often produces so little faith in God? How come all the information we learn how come we find contradictions? How come? How come we have problems with the scripture? How come we're debating? How come we're doubting? And because we're doubting, we don't live it. And because we don't doubt, we don't live it. We don't see much of God. But Mary was exactly opposite. A young girl with no particular name. Interesting village where she was born. Not a profound family. Guess what happens? Guess what happens? She knows little, but she believes a lot. This is incredible. You know what would happen in your life if you are actually growing in your faith rather than your knowledge? You know what would happen in your life if you actually grew in your trust in God, in your trust in God rather than the information how crazy we are about finding more finding more discovering more and your brain is constantly searching for more information but why is it that the more we search why is it that we send our kids to colleges and universities we want them to study the scripture and become scholars and then we observe one by one falling off. Not just off the ministry path, but even walking with God. This girl, and by the way, let me make it very simple. This is not a fairy tale. I believe angel showed up in a form of a human being, a man. So he showed up. Obviously, there was glory of God. We know that from background. So here, here is a man who bears God's glory all over him. He shows up and he's talking to Mary in normal language. Listen, by the way, if anybody's trying to speak to you in tongues on behalf of the Lord, just say, hug the person and say, hey, you want a cup of coffee? Because God always talks in a normal language. Those of us that love to speak in tongues, it is to feed your spirit, grow your spirit. That's it. Don't speak to people in tongues, especially when you preach it. Don't over-spiritualize God. God is so simple, it's crazy. How many times have you read in the script that Jesus spoke in tongues? Please find it because my Bible does not say. Maybe yours does. And if, if it does, please throw it away. But I'm just saying is, it's just so simple. He shows up. He's talking to her. She understands. He uses normal language. That's it. That is, God loves you so much that he comes and speaks to you on your level, on your terms, in your language. So if somebody comes to you and says some mysterious, like, knowledge that you have to discover and and grow into and one day please please God is a storyteller in a simple language so angel this man shows up he's talking to Mary and he's just telling her what God's purpose is God's heart is he's telling her incredible things and she's like hey I'm not married I'm not married yet I'm just engaged and the man is who knows where He's trying to make a living. I mean, we're poor. They were so poor, they could not even buy a proper sacrifice, a lamb. They had to buy pigeons. It was so cheap that kids would catch pigeons and bring to temple and sell it to people like Mary and Joseph. Pigeons were sold, are you ready for this? For a quarter in a temple. Because they were so poor, they would buy it from a little kids that caught pigeons around town so here she is listening to God and watch this love this 
right after angel says, for nothing is impossible with God, verse 37, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Some translations. Be it unto me according to your word. She says, here I am. Think about it. My friends, I have a simple question for all of us. What is it that, that stops us believing God? Do we overanalyze, maybe even over-spiritualize things, and therefore we diminish our faith? Do you think that maybe we know too much of theology? Maybe we're trying to balance it with the knowledge of other scriptures. And therefore we sow a seed of doubt in our mind. So anytime God is speaking to us through a man, a woman, another human being in a form of another human being. We're like, ah, uh, sounds suspicious. My advice to you based on a scripture. Anytime you feel in your spirit. It is the Lord speaking. My advice to you is grow your faith in those words rather than grow your doubt about the words or the person. Because Mary could have really doubted the man that was speaking to her, especially the words. Yeah, Holy Spirit will overcome you. You'll conceive a baby. Yeah, no Joseph baby, no. Holy Spirit. Wow. Love what she says. May everything you have said about me come true. Just, I need to make the statement because a lot of us, a lot of us, even though I did not, but I'm one of you, have a Catholic and Orthodox background. Mary should never be an object of our faith, she should be an example for our faith. Please don't make Mary another God. She's not. And please do not, do not pray to Mary. She is highly favored just like you and I. She's privileged to birth God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. But don't make her an object of your faith. She doesn't pray for you. She's not a priestess. Jesus is the high priest. Okay. But to me, she's an example of faith. Why? Because, let me say this because we're about to pray. It does not matter where you come from. All that matters is, have you received God's favor? Think about it. This Christmas, you should have an amazing time. Not because... You, somebody just sends you to Whole Foods and you bought everything you could ever imagine. Or PCC or whatever store. Okay. Or somebody brought something to you. That's, that doesn't define your Christmas. And it's not even about who invited you and who you invited to celebrate. And it's not even a compliment you got. This Christmas you should have the best time of your life. Is because of this. All you have to remember. God loves me. And if you are gearing yourself up with, with these thoughts, if you contemplate, if you think about it, if you remember it, if you speak it out, if you thank him, if you are grateful to him for loving you, for expressing his grace, his favor to you, it's all you have to do. If you do that, I promise you, little that you know, because you'll be thanking God, you'll get his attention. And because you get his attention, God is talking. God loves to talk to his people. And as he's talking to you, thank you, Porfir and Anya, thank you. As he's talking to you, he might be telling you a lot of things about your life, about your future. God might be telling you about your family. He might be telling you about your job. He might be telling you about your neighbor. And at that moment, from your gratitude grow into Lord I trust you I believe you I trust you the interesting thing about God is that when he is promising you something or he is inspiring you about something 
the interesting thing about God that he does not want you to labor hard for him. That is so interesting. God doesn't say, well, you go to school, get straight 4.0, okay? You're really nice. Everybody else is working or volunteering three hours a week or five or six hours, and you go 20 hours. People are impressed. And you are truly in a Cinderella. But watch what God would know. He says, Mary, this is what is about to happen. And all she says, I am your servant. In other words, here I am. Whatever you want me to do, I trust you. Truly significant. 